Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. This is the Fireside Chat, the coming cyber war and what to expect and what you should know. In this Fireside Chat, Mark Crutchington and I are going to sit down and discuss the coming cyber war, which also happens to be the title of his forthcoming book. We've seen over the past number of years tensions as well as socioeconomic shifts in countries across the globe, along with the advancement and proliferation of cybersecurity tools and technology are creating the potential for cyber warfare. What does this mean for the United States and what do our government leaders need to do? What will be the next cyber or technology wave that contributes to this and what do corporate technology executives need to know? How as cybersecurity and technology leaders can you prepare for the coming cyber war? So Mark, that is a fantastic introduction. Uh, I'm really glad you're joining me today and I'm really glad you invited me to do this with you. Um, Absolutely. Just, just for the audience, uh, my name is Andy Bennett. I'm the former deputy CISO of the state of Texas. I've got a lot of experience with a lot of things relevant to this topic and I'm super excited about it. Mark, for the audience, can you introduce yourself? Sure, thank you, Andy, and, and thanks for uh, joining. Uh, my name is Mark Crudgington. I am the uh, CISO, SVP Information Security at Wood Forest National Bank. Uh, we're a large regional bank headquartered in the Woodlands, Texas. We have over 750 branches and roughly 5,000 employees. Uh, we're in 17 states and a few other states. Uh, we have commercial offices and satellite offices. I've been there about eight years and I'm looking forward to the chat. Fantastic, me too. So, you know, cyber warfare invokes a lot of emotions, a lot of visceral pictures, a lot of thoughts and everybody who hears it all of a sudden, even if they've never thought of the topic has an opinion. So when you say cyber war, what do you mean? What is meant by cyber war? Well, really, it's, it's very similar to a conventional war, except for by cyber means, by technology means. And that can either be a, a nation state attacking another state or a nation state's proxies uh, attacking another state. Uh, it can also be, you know, hacktivists attacking states. But it's essentially uh, a, a cyber attack on, on a nation state by other entities. Um, now, the, the interesting thing is, is this has been happening for quite some time. Uh, people may not be aware of it, but it, it hasn't developed into a quote unquote all out public war like you might see on CNN. But there's, you know, much like the ocean's current, uh, unless you're in it, you don't really feel it. So it's kind of happening, has been happening for quite some time. Uh, even going back to the 80s, and, and you and I had this discussion a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. uh, and it's mentioned in my book, uh, an, an instance that happened in, at, in a Siberian pipeline in the early 80s. Um, and I, I think many people think that Stuxnet was the first kind of cyber weapon, but um, as you pointed out to me, um, that there was a, a, an explosion out in the Siberian pipeline in 1982. And I think people just need to Google that, CIA pipeline explosion in Siberia, and they'll get all the information they need to know. Um, so I think that's what cyber war now, I believe that un until deaths start happening, that th this won't get and hopefully it never comes to that, but it won't bleed over into a, a conventional war in that. But th there's got to be some red line when, when it's crossed, it, 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 it's gonna escalate, so. Fair enough, so the, the 1982 Siberia pipeline, I'll save everybody a, a Google search real quick. Uh, that actually resulted in the single largest non-nuclear man-made explosion in US history and was completely caused by cyber means. And so it's, it's really a compelling starting point for the story. And I'm glad you included it in your book. It was a good read, right? The, the reading up on it. Yeah, it's quite fascinating. And, and, and to your point, the explosion was so large, it could be seen from space. So Absolutely. Uh, it just exactly. vaporized a section of a pipeline. And interestingly enough, no one got injured, so. Yeah, it was, it, it, as surgical strikes go, cyber provides a means for, 
for really, really close in work in places where there are no people, which is the reason yeah. there are systems there in the first place. The reason that the pipeline could be compromised is the remote SCADA, ICS, IOT, whatever they were called back then, it was just SCADA, but now we have lots of names for yeah. these operational technologies. Uh, are out there so that no person has to go out into the wilderness in Siberia to turn the, the wrenches on the pipeline. But when you don't secure that system, you leave it open, even in 1982. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, you said something about, about the, the cyber kinetic nature, the, where the, the cyber reaches the real world and about thresholds. And I'd like to highlight for the audience and, and get ready for the next section of our discussion that the thresholds have already been drawn in some places and cyber attacks have been met in parts of the world by physical retaliation. Yes. So there was a cyber that Israel specifically has in more than one case now, uh, at, at least one case, I guess I should say, I, I only know of one in particular, uh, responded to a cyber attack with a cruise missile. And so uh, that, that line has been drawn at least once, and I believe more than one time now, and, but there's no gold standard for it. The, you, you've highlighted that cyber warfare has been going on a long time, but let's talk about the means, methods. That, that's a discussion of the means and methods. What about an actual cyber war? Is there a cyber war, an active cyber war? You said you're in it and, and, the, and you're, you understand it because if you're in it, you can see it. Talk, about, talk to us about uh, the cyber war that you see and, and how long it's actually been going on, not just since the first cyber weapon appeared, but how long have we been at cyber war in your opinion? Because I'm, I'm guessing that's your assertion. Yeah, I, I think so. And it's more like a, a, a tit for tat kind of thing. And, you know, nation states are hiring their proxies to act on their behalf. And, you know, if I had to pinpoint it, I would guess probably somewhere in the early 2000s, mid 2000s. And, and it was so prevalent in that period that the U.S. stood up a cyber command. So I, I think if, you know, uh, the U.S. wouldn't stand up something like that unless there was something brewing uh, and there was a need to respond. So I think you could probably go back to then to say, okay, we've been in some form of cyber war. No, it doesn't look like a conventional war because you, you don't see bombs dropping and that. But nation states attacking nation states uh, and doing some damage and, and that led to uh, Stuxnet. You know, when, when Iran was trying to create nuclear weapons uh, or the means to create nuclear weapons, um, we, we had the Stuxnet incident in the Iranian rich enrichment facility. So I think it's probably been going on for at least the mid 2000s. Um, and who knows? I mean, I have not done enough research to say here is the first date. And I guarantee you, if I did do that, someone would come out and say, no, it was this date, not that date. So, sure, you know, we'll call it 15 or so years. Uh, and I'm positive that there are some people who would say we're actually not at cyber war. There's no cyber war because cyber war can't stand alone. It would be in order to have war, you have to have nation states. And so I'd like to explore that perspective just a little before we move on, is from my perspective, cyber war has redefined, has been redefining the nature of warfare very much in the same way that we've gone to war against lots of other things. We went to war, a war against drugs, regardless of mm -hmm. its success or not. The terminology is definitely there, a war on drugs. But later on, the war on terrorism really picked up steam, really like full on military campaigns, full on uh, invasion of countries based on a war of, against terrorism, not necessarily starting out as a war on any individual nation. And I think in no theater of war is that more of a reality than in cyber war. And mm -hmm. we live, I've said this in other, in other places before, I believe that we live in an era where uh, it is unique in history because a bored 15 year old with some talent and a bad uh, talent connectivity and a cheap laptop can potentially wield the same amount of power in a cyber attack as a well-funded nation state. If yeah. they find the right opening, the right place, 
and have just enough bad judgment to go ahead and click the button, right? Yes. And so uh, it's very hard to pin cyber war down because I don't think it requires a nation state aggressor to be at, for a nation to be at war. It can be an individual, it can be a group of private individuals. Activists. Activists, whatever, whatever category of threat actor who decide to make war and the nation under attack is just as at war against that stateless entity as they otherwise would have been had it been a kinetic assault from one country to another. And it's, it's super interesting, the, the, the philosophizing. And I don't, I don't get to think about this kind of stuff in my day job or in my previous day job all that much. Yeah. So it's a lot of fun. A couple day jobs ago, I did get to think about these things. Yeah. So, <laughs> so moving down our list of talking points that, that we had discussed, uh, who, who are the major players involved in the cyber war as you see it? And, and I'm sure you did some research on this. So who are the major players? Well, I, I think it's it's much like the major players that we have in, in kinetic arms and kinetic wars. Obviously, the U.S., Russia, China, Iran, uh, European countries, um, even now some South American countries are getting involved. But it really comes down to some of their proxies and state-sponsored uh, APTs, um, advanced persistent threats that are out there that are acting on behalf of a nation or sponsored by their military, part of their military. You also, uh, as we talked a little bit about, you, ha- you have hacktivists that are that are out there creating havoc. Um, in, in most cases, you see those people, hacktivists acting against corporations, but they have, have acted against, you know, countries, governments as well. Oh, um, absolutely. I, I can yeah. vouch for that 100%. Hacktivists yeah. go after government entities all the time. And, and that's primarily, you know, denial of service type attacks, but you might see other attacks as well. Um, and, you know, there is the criminal element that's, that's now spilling over into this, um, you know, in finance right now, we're seeing a lot from Nigeria. Um, so it runs the gamut, um, you know, but obviously you have the major players that we do uh, in terms of countries, but then, you know, uh, a lot is being carried out by their proxies. Sure. Well, I mean, proxy war is not new, right? So yeah. you, you mentioned a lot of nation states, a lot of political groups, a lot of threat actor types. What about on the, the this just occurred to me, by the way, what about on the commercial side? Are the players the same? Are the same people who make traditional kinetic weapons now making cyber weapons? Is that, how, what do you see there? I I do, and and this goes back to the APTs that are sponsored by those countries' militaries. There's a lot of APT groups that are, you know, based out of Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, and they are creating, uh, um, you know, cyber weapons. Obviously we have Israel and the U.S. involved as well. There's been uh, activity in South America, Central America, um, in some of these, you know, nation states and their proxies. Uh, for instance, the Sony attack, everybody knows, was a big attack by North Korea and one of their APT groups. Um, they're not only doing it just to create havoc or whatever, but they're also doing it to to fund terrorist means as well, in specifically in Middle Eastern countries. But, you know, North Korea is doing this as a, as a way of surviving by, you know, stealing data and selling that data, um, you know, on the dark web and dark net. So, yes, definitely um, they are creating the cyber weapons um, and continue to do so at a rapid pace. Many of these you can buy on the dark web, uh, which is very interesting if you ever are bored on a, on a weekend and you want to cruise around the dark web, uh, you know, just do it off your home network and on a computer you normally don't use, but there are some pretty fascinating things that you can find out there. And I do talk about that a little bit in my book uh, that you mentioned, but you can also find some pretty gruesome things as well. So um, make sure no kids are around when you're doing that. Yeah. If you're going to spend your weekend on the dark web, uh, hopefully you don't like it too much because you probably shouldn't spend too many weekends there. Yeah, uh, I'm just saying. 
So you mentioned the commoditization of these cyber weapons, and, and I was really looking for, are you aware of any like uh, private US private sector, uh, NATO allied nation private sector companies like uh, and Raytheon is somebody who comes to mind making cyber weapons. And I, I honestly haven't seen, but I assume that they are. I, I just assume they are. So, but you mentioned the commoditization and, and you didn't call it that, I'm calling it that where they're yeah. taking these and they're, they're putting them on the marketplace. They're, they're creating these cyber weapons, these means to create cyber havoc to uh, ransomware is a big example. Ransomware mm -hmm. toolkits are out there on, on the dark web for, uh, for sale all the time. They get yeah. used in attacks across the board. The motives of the attacks are, are ranging from uh, enriching oneself or, or criminal organization all the way to taking down a, a uh, foreign government that you are opposed to and everything in between, right? So sure. Trying, to, trying to, to perpetrate an act of war all the way down to, I just want to get paid. And uh, I saw one, I saw a tweet from um, Malware Jake, at Malware Jake, just in case anybody wants to go check it out, find it. He tweets a lot, so you may not be able to find it. But he says in one of his recent tweets that, Ransomware has been so successful and so lucrative that it's literally created a hacker shortage, and they are having to recruit and even partner with uh, with uh, rival organizations in order to meet the ransomware demand. Yeah. And that is just crazy. It's one trend of many. What other trends do you think people in the audience need to know about when they consider cyber war and how it, it affects them and their organizations? What trends should they be aware of? Well, that, that's certainly uh, one of the trends, and, and you're right, you know, um, you, on, on the dark web, you can find, you know, hacking as a service now. So there are a lot of different types of hacks that you can, you can pay a, a hacker to do, and ransomware is one, and, and I'm assuming you set up your account in some way and hire them, and they'll funnel all the money or a portion of it into your account. But when I, when I look at trends that are really going to affect us in the future, I think of things like the proliferation of artificial intelligence and how that one is going to affect cyber defenses, but also cyber offenses. Um, so that's one trend to watch. I also think uh, quantum computing is going to be something to watch. And these may not be quote unquote cyber trends, but they're trends in technology that will uh, rapidly advance, you know, cyber weapons. Um, the, that's fair. You know, when, when, when quantum computing comes to fruition uh, and it gets in the hands of the wrong people, today's strongest encryption will be broken in a matter of seconds. Uh, now, again, we always hope that the offensive side gets ahead of this, and, and, and there is a lot of work going on that now. Uh, but I believe one of the biggest trends that may not necessarily be related to technology is actually just people. Where are we going to get all the people to help defend not only the country and countries, but also um, defend, you know, companies, you know, so in the, the cyber war is not just going to be between nation states that we've, as we've kind of alluded to, it, it's, it's now happening across the board. Um, so th there is going to be some, you know, issues around that with companies, how are they defending themselves? And, and, and obviously, you know, companies have enough trouble as it is now, um, but I, I believe we're, we're going to have to do something. And I almost liken it to, um, you know, something like where the government might set up uh, like the Peace Corps, but call it the Cyber Peace Corps, where, you know, if you go into cyber and we'll train you and then you go out for two years or whatever the time frame is, you know, something like that needs to happen. So for anybody out there listening, there, there are some programs kind of like that. I just want to pause and, and hit on that because you make a great point that in our previous discussions, we didn't hit that. Uh, there are programs that uh, are based on a scholarship for service yep. model where young people can get paid to go through school, but then owe a commitment to the government 
to uh, federal or local government or, or to a company potentially. Yes. Companies could pick up on this uh, scholarship for service model where they go to, they pay for a student's college tuition, they go through their college courses, they make good grades, they work for you every summer, you pay them a, a decent wage and they have a decent job waiting for them at exit yeah. where they owe you a two to four year commitment, very much the same way. Scholarship for service is a very good model. Uh, yeah, there, there are DOD programs out there now. Yes. Um, in, in my my stressing of this is, I, I believe they need to happen on, on a more rapid pace and more known. It needs to even start earlier than, you know, college, you know, and, and you do see a lot of programs being stood up for high school students in STEM fields, but it, it needs to rapidly evolve to, you know, so so we're, we're, we're drifting way far off of our notes and I'm digging the discussion. Uh, one of the big issues with that though is funding. How do you fund that? How do you redirect people's attention to that? And I feel like that's gonna be our bridge back to cyber warfare there. But funding is the number one issue there and getting, getting folks to, to see the pipeline as the priority and being willing to take the risk because it is inherently a risk to invest time and resources into high schoolers and underclassmen college students who uh, who may or may not ultimately end up being the people they're looking for. So how do we fund that? How do we how do we drive that buy-in? What do you think? Well, you know, obviously the the easy answer to that would be, you know, it's gonna have to come through, you know, taxes. But you know, just like we fund a lot of things that are quote unquote like the drug war you mentioned earlier, we confiscate those drugs and there's a value for them. Well, it would be a lot easier, I think, to fund this kind of thing in the cyber war because we can go out and, and we have an easier means to market uh, what we would confiscate from the cyber war, essentially Bitcoin or money or whatever it is, then we can go out. You don't see Uncle Sam standing on the corner selling cocaine, but well, you know, as, far as, as, as we as confiscated. As far as I, I'm not sure that I agree with that dichotomy. I see exactly where you're going and, and I like it, but I'm not sure I agree with it specifically because the, the drug war, the war on drugs and lots of other similar traditional policing, military actions, kinds of things that self-fund through those, those types of vehicles, they, they don't, um, they seize and destroy the cocaine. God, I hope they're destroying the cocaine. Yeah. Uh, I believe they are destroying the cocaine, but it's the cars, it's the houses, it's all the collateral things around uh, the, the illicit illegal activities that they actually derive funding from. And yeah. while Bitcoin is definitely possibly a, a thing, if you could seize and, and get a hold of Bitcoin, which Bitcoin is notoriously hard to seize, easy to steal, hard to seize. Yes. Uh, it, it's, uh, I should say, easier to seize. But those criminals do have regular bank accounts and they are turning that Bitcoin into some form of money. And that's how I think they could seize, seize and freeze uh, their assets and then get money that way. Well, now we're really drifting off because now we yes. just entered into international politics and extradition treaties and all those yes. kinds of things. Because a lot of, as, as I think you mentioned earlier, uh, a lot of these folks operate in countries and jurisdictions where that's just not feasible. We don't even have access as a nation to the banking systems of some of these localities. So right. I, I, you highlight a number of interesting points, and I'm not sure we have a solution today, but that's kind of why we're having these conversations, right? Sure. So uh, all of this highlights a lot of escalation. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sum up everything you just said, all the issues you brought up as escalation. And... Uh, the, the causes of these escalations, what do you think is pushing cyber warfare to, to be, cyber war uh, being the totality of everything we've discussed to escalate? And I'm gonna highlight something just, just for objectively, we live in an unprecedented era of low violent crime. We have had yeah. a recent spat of unrest in the country and, and, and I don't intend to diminish that whatsoever. Uh, for both its importance and its impact on these statistics. But historically, over time, we have record low uh, violent crime. But you've mm -hmm. highlighted a lot of escalations of what are both 
acts of war and crimes, some of which are for uh, traditional criminal motives, means, etc., to steal people's money, to uh, hold things ransom for money, to uh, to get money in 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 the due course of criminal enterprise, or in the case of of North Korea, as you said, to fund their government. Their their a lot of their criminal activities are there. So, what do you think are the are the are the drivers? What are the causes of these escalations? Everything we've talked about. What are the underlying causes, in your opinion? Well, I, I think some of the underlying causes are obviously the, you know, you see a lot in the geopolitical uh, tensions b- between countries, and, and those have, have existed for years. So with, with those tensions um, still present and increasing in some cases, many cases, and then the proliferation of technology and the ease that these things can be done in, in countries now, in, instead of turning into the kinetic war, they've turned their attention to technology. I think that is causing some of the escalations. Um, so just so, ease of access. Yeah, ease of access. And we, and, we, and we talked about that just, you know, in the, in the quote unquote cyber bazaar, as it's called, um, the availability. Um, and so I, I think that is is um, adding to it. But you 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 think of how easy you can train someone to sit behind a desk in the middle of nowhere with an internet connection and have them launch, you know, campaigns against as many countries, entities that they want versus a kinetic war where it's a point strike, a point strike, a point strike. I think the ease of how we can attack and how attacks are happening is creating to this rise as well. And then, you know, the geopolitical uh, we mentioned, but also I think there is like an, an underlying, you know, poverty aspect to this, that it's easy to recruit someone that's, that's poor, train them. Um, they don't have any other means, so you you train them in this way, and they become part of your quote unquote cyber army. So the re- the recruiting of of uh, younger people um, that are wanting to you know get involved in this type of activity, uh, it's lucrative. Obviously, we said that also. Um, I think those are all you know creating this kind of wave or escalation, if you will of what is going on right now and, w- and will continue. I, and I, I think I'd like to add one thing that, that I, I, I really want to harp on is cyber comes with lower risk, Yeah. right? And that, that bright line that you defined, that you said needed to be defined right at the beginning of our discussion about at what point does cyber become physical in terms of our response? And uh, I'm not sure I have an answer for th- where that line is, but cyber, cyber aggression, cyber crime, and cyber malfeasance of all forms have a lower physical, tangible risk to the perpetrators than uh, a traditional uh, kinetic action. And whether that's a mugging on the street or a full-scale invasion, uh, mm-hmm. the, the risk, the tangible, personal, bodily risk to the, to the aggressors in the situations is so much massively lower that uh, once once the tools for this type of attack, once an activity became readily available, if I'm a criminal, it's a no-brainer, right? Yeah. So it makes sense. Um, all of that being, being said, um, what are some of the contributing factors that are cybersecurities or technology related? You mentioned ease of access. I'm gonna add on ease of use, but- yeah. Uh, I, I feel like I feel like this is where uh, us as the CISO crowd we need to highlight uh, what what's letting these bad guys in. What what are the what are the cybersecurity technology related reasons that this is even available as a tool? Yeah, and and we talked about it a little bit with some of the things that are to come. But I I think you know you know going back to the the protection. Uh, I don't believe as a whole that, and you may know this more than anyone because of your previous job or as much as anyone, uh, cause you saw it across the board, but we, we haven't got the baseline 
baseline security practices down to a, a quote unquote acceptable level. We're still have trouble patching. We still have, you know, trouble with some of the most basic things, change management, whatever. They're, they're all going on. And so, as you mentioned, you know, in terms of like, you know, physical crime versus cyber crime, you know, why would I need to leave my house when it's so easy to pick off, you know, thousands of people with an email or whatever? So all of these things, and, and I will also go back to, I just don't believe the awareness has reached the point to where it needs to be, to where everybody is kind of cyber aware. And, and they- and, so and let's, some, let's push on that a little. What do you mean when you say everybody and the point where it needs to be? So I have opinions, but I wanna hear yours first. Um, yeah. where, where does, what is the most critical population to make cyber aware? Where do we start? If it hasn't made it to everybody, where do we push right now? Let's start there. Yeah, that's a good question, Andy. Um, I think where you start, if, you, if you're talking about from a corporate perspective, it's got to start with the board and other executives in the company and go from that top-down approach. And this is risk one, top three risk, whatever. And you see all those board reports that are happening. It also, I, as an individual, I, I just believe everybody needs to be more aware of kind of the data that they're putting out there and how easily accessible it is. But unfortunately, I just don't know if that's going to happen because I think it, it's become breach fatigue now that we expect our data to get breached. And it's like, okay, what, what can I do? Um, but it also starts, you know, or continues into, we mentioned before, in, in terms of education and how we train our, our kids and how we train um, our next generation of technology leaders um, as well. So I believe all of those things, you know, um, if, if they happen together with maybe some government initiatives and programs, and we have seen the U.S. do a pretty good job of, um, you know, cyber, cyber litigation or cyber laws, and it's continued through administrations, which is good to see. Um, but, but I think there's um, a, a bit more awareness and not just settling for the status quo that needs to happen. Like this is part of our daily life now. There needs to be more investment. So I, I, I will say investment right there. I'm glad you said that because I will say as a former government insider, I'll put that hat on, uh, very recent former, while there are new laws and while there are good intentions across the board, no one has actually put their money where their mouth is and invested in the solutions. And that goes for the government and, and for the most part, the private sector. There are pockets, financial, due, because it's been heavily regulated to do so, has done a better job than a lot of sectors. And there mm -hmm. are individual organizations who take the threat of cyber very, very seriously. But holistically across the board, the problem is the investment has not been made. People do not put their money where their mouth is, and with good business driver reasons why they don't. I don't want to. I don't right. want to. I don't want it to sound like I don't understand the reasons. I do 100% understand, and in some cases even agree with the reasons. But until people start actually putting the money against the problem and investing in solutions, I don't think we're going to actually make really good progress in solving the problem. So I kind of teed you up to, to, to you led me exactly where I wanted that to go. So cool. <laughs> uh, I was really hoping you'd do that because investment is key. You got to invest in the yes. people, you got to invest in the systems and you got and to time. invest in the principles. Yeah. hundred percent. And, and it takes time. Yeah, it, it really, it, it takes time and it's going to be a big shift, right? We're talking about technology that has changed the way we work faster than anything ever ever and yeah. and speaking as a as a person with a an undergraduate degree in history who is constantly complaining to people that they don't see the big picture and long timelines and that history has repeated itself over and over again all of that is true except that the cycle this time has been compressed 
the the smartphone only came out in 2007. Yeah, it's amazing, huh? Right. And we're we are rapidly approaching a full generation, 20 years being the, the typically recognized generation. We're rapidly approaching a full generation of people who have never lived in a different world. And the impact that has had on us on, on around us and the way we do business, the way we live, the way we even interact. Normally, you and I would be sitting right next to each other across from each other on a stage. There'd be an audience of 500 people out in front of us. I'm assuming this is a big event. And we would just be having a conversation. And yeah. if somebody from the audience were to make a comment right now, we would be able to say, oh, yeah, totally. And we would take that feedback. But right yeah. now, technology has changed and mediated our lives through other circumstances as drivers as well, that the solutions for the life portion have gotten the attention, but I still think we are massively neglecting the investment in the cyber side, starting with awareness. And I think that's got to start at the top. So yeah. uh, uh, rant over, I'll move on. Uh, <clears throat> actually, <laughs> it leads on to the next question on the page really well. So in your opinion, what does the government need to do from a national perspective? You kind of touched on it, so go ahead and hit it hard. What does the government need to do now from a national perspective to help address the concerns of cyber war that we've discussed, the concerns of cyber crime and education and awareness that we've drifted into? What, yeah. what can and what should they be doing right now? Well, obviously investing more in, in the programs that we have already started investing in as a nation. Um, and I believe there needs to be a, a little bit more uh, accountability. And, um, you know, in terms of investing in, you know, what is the future of our cyber defenses going to look like as well uh, across the board? And, you know, certain government funded programs for that. Um, I, I also believe that, um, you know, when you talk about cybercrime, you know, you are, you're obviously data privacy comes up and what businesses have to do. And, and I know uh, this is not an easy task, but we do need a national uh, data privacy law. Um, I know with 50 states and, and other um, out, outlying, you know, um, entities that are U.S. controlled, that's going to be difficult, um, you know, to come up with a privacy law that governs the entire country and, and get our, all the states uh, on board and to agree to it. Because certainly, as you know, uh, the privacy law in California and New York would would look a whole lot differently than it would in Alabama and Texas or Nebraska oh, yeah. and Washington. So, but where that comes into play is like, imagine if you're a, a national bank and you've got branches in all 50 states and you've, you've got a breach or whatever entity. Now I've got to go out and comply with 50 states and, and litigate 50 with 50 states and, that is very onerous on companies. And if you're a smaller company, you cannot, you cannot withstand that. Now, it goes back to what we talked about before, invest a little bit more and maybe you won't find yourself in that situation. But I do believe that that is something that, you know, the government needs to really focus on is coming up with a national privacy law. Um, I also think there's a lot of investment in, and, you know, you want to talk about recruiting and, and military, you know, people may be apprehensive to join the military because they don't want to go out and quote unquote, you know, fire a gun or whatever you want to say, you know, but maybe recruit in a different manner for a cyber army. Um, and so there's a lot of things the government can do. Um, the, there are programs that are available and maybe they just need to be made more widely aware of because we as in security know about these programs that, that the FBI or Department of Homeland Security does. The Department of Homeland Security will come out and do an, a, a security assessment on your environment for free. Now, you've, there is a line, but it is free. Um, so there are a lot of things like that and maybe they maybe they can up their investment in that somehow to where that can happen more. Um, so those are some of the things that come to mind right now. Okay. 
that very last one, I agree with that completely. The the DHS program, the results from that program are very good, but the waiting yeah. line is very long. And uh, and I have had the opportunity to provide direct feedback to leadership at DHS that that program needs, deserves, and and re and absolutely should get uh, additional funding and resources specifically to shorten that line. So Definitely. I agree with you completely there. Um, and, and that also leads on to what about helping with businesses? I think, I think that Homeland Security and that program alone could go a long way to helping businesses with cyber. Um, something that's not on our page of notes that, that kind of came to me while you were discussing, you used the word accountability and you said accountability to protection and stuff like that, but you didn't say who we should hold accountable. And I'd like to explore that just a little. When we talk about accountability, are we talking about accountability to ourselves? Are we talking about accountability to the nation, accountability to a standards or to standards? Or are we talking about accountability at an organizational level? Is it leadership? Um, who are we holding accountable? What does accountability mean in the context of what you just said? Well, account accountability, one, to ourselves. We all have to be responsible for our own cyber hygiene. But really, accountability at an organization, and we're starting to see that happen now, where either there's job losses or lawsuits involving, you know, boards. And I, I'm not one to get into litigation and all that. But, you know, when you start holding individuals accountable that are officers in a company, maybe that investment will come. And um, I don't believe it should have to come to that, but it, but it does. Isn't that a little um, like strong arming? Yeah, uh, and um, so that, that's kind of what I mean by accountability. But I, I mean, if you if you take this from a national security perspective and a national level, at the, the, U, the U.S. government could strong arm certain other entities and say that if you don't do this, we won't fund you. Or if you don't have this, you meet this particular level, we won't fund you in some cases. But I don't, I don't think that if you made this a national security and it, it came out broadly as a, a national security issue, that like we see terror right now, uh, we would not have that problem. People would get on board. Um, some may reluctantly, but they would be on board. Um, I, so I'm, I'm not sure I agree with you there, but I also don't know that I have a basis for disagreeing. Uh, I think that the the relative success of the war on terror and its and 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 making terrorism a top national security issue versus a priority of the FBI as it was before 9/11 um, doesn't necessarily 20 years in change enough. Uh, it, it hasn't brought people together on the issue, and I'm not sure that national security. National awareness, making people aware and awareness campaigns and, yeah. and showing people why it matters, possibly holding executives accountable. But I think that's a whole nother, that's a whole 45 minute discussion all on its own right yeah, there. Definitely. Um, I, all that stuff. So I, I reserve the right to have an opinion later, but I, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that, uh, that I'm on the same page, but I think that's because I'm not sure there is a single right page. Um, what about corporate technology executives uh, as well as small businesses? You got the biggest of the big and the smallest of the small. And a lot of those laws you talked about, the privacy laws, cybersecurity laws and stuff, they have different rules for different sizes, which is appropriate. Mm -hmm. But what are the things that big or small uh, everyone should know about and be doing? And then uh, three part question here, big or small, what are the things that everybody should be doing? Uh, big. What's the number one thing that a big company executive, let's go, let's pick CEOs as the executive. So we have one for one and then small business owners. So everyone, CEOs, small business owners, what do they need to be aware of cyber? Well, everyone needs to be aware that, you know, this is rapidly evolving and rapidly uh, escalating to where everybody is a target. And I, I think maybe this audience will get that. Uh, but the, if I'm they sure understood, they it, yeah, this is, you know, IT or security audience here. Um, 
So if, if they really knew how easy it was to get their data and, and saw that, maybe even saw some things on the dark web, uh, it might wake them up even further. Uh, but in terms of an, of an executive, and, and we've seen this going back to Target, and it's now escalating even more, that executives are, are being held accountable in a number of ways. You're, you're starting to see lawsuits against officers of companies, for one. But it's about your reputation also. If, if, you, are, if you are involved in a breach and it comes out that you are negligent, and, and you knew something was wrong, but you did not do something about it, then that's a whole nother ball game versus we had a breach. We, we were doing everything we can and here's how they justify that. But being totally negligent and unaware of a situation, that's a whole nother story. So that could ruin your career right there. So uh, I, I will say that statistically, it doesn't ruin anybody's career. Are you saying that it should? No, no I'm saying it, it, it should. And it, it, your reputation is at stake. And if they are found negligent, there's a difference between a, a breach happened versus sure. Sure. We, we were negligent and we didn't fix the problem. That's a whole different story. It, it definitely opens them up to litigation and various other things. But yeah. I'm very disappointed in the, in the results of the latest studies on these issues because they all, almost all, have pointed to the, a cyber incident, regardless of negligence, non-negligence, et cetera, having little to no impact on the companies. Uh, maybe somebody gets fired, but they just end up at another company, all yeah. that kind of stuff, right? There, there isn't really accountability like we previously discussed. The, the disruption to that is, can be pretty significant, but yes, uh, you know, I agree a good, good CEO or whatever may be able to get another job, but at what cost? Um, and then in terms of small businesses, you know, they're one of the most vulnerable because they don't have the resources to apply as a big company would. And, but they may be just as attractive. Um, and, they potentially can just be flat out out of business if, if something were to happen. Uh, and there are cases where this has happened, where ransomware has locked up a, a company's uh, entire infrastructure and they could not afford the ransom. And so what do, what do you do at that point? If you don't have proper backups and you know ability to restore on and on, I mean, you're pretty much done. So I'm very much on record here, and I'm just going to reiterate that uh, even if they could afford the ransom, they should just reinvest that in, in new infrastructure. Uh, don't pay the ransom. And, yeah. I've, and I have gotten asked the question, but what if the ransom's only five bucks? Integrity is priceless, people. Okay. Yeah. That, and you're like, enabling seriously. them. Seriously. Enabling them, and that money could be going toward other nefarious means such as terrorism. A absolutely. And, and, and you are also right. Uh, and even if they can't afford to pay the, the ransom, and even if uh, all things are created equal and they manage to recover their systems, studies have shown that the costs of recovering from a major cyber attack on small businesses, if they are not prepared, uh, they don't have a good plan, they don't have good backups, they don't have whatever in place that they needed, uh, a, a large portion of those companies are out of business within six months, the small business market. The large businesses can weather just about anything as history has shown us, but uh, the, the small companies, if they get hit hard uh, and don't have a really robust plan already in place, are very likely to be out of business within six months. Yeah. So uh, All right. let's see. We've come a long way. We've covered a lot of yeah. ground and I, I just looked at the clock and we're about out of time for our time slot. So uh, I want to try to tie it all together. We covered cyber war, cyber warfare, the various state uh, and non-state actors, the methods, the means, various other things. We transitioned into awareness education and we brought it all the way down to the need for a national privacy law, which again, that could be a whole nother 45 minute discussion. And, and how and what that might look like and how it would cause problems, what it would solve. But tying it all back together, going all the way from cyber war to personal PII privacy, what are your closing thoughts on this matter? Well, I, 
I believe that we are in the infancy stages of cyber warfare, cyber crime. Um, as we talked about the proliferation of new technologies, uh, technology being easily accessible to a larger number of populations will only increase um, cyber warfare possibilities and cyber crime. I think corporations, as we talked about, really need to step up their investment um, and take the matter a lot more seriously. Um, you know, there, there are certain maturity models that you can put in place that will help you improve the, your program. Um, certainly awareness goes a long way, but just the doing the basics, you can't move to the next phase until you've got the basics under control. Um, so I think that's a lot of what companies need to do in, in terms of looking at maturity, but th the future, you know, there are a lot of investments going on as we talked about some of them in, in terms of how we invest our next generation of technology leaders. I think we need to continue doing that and that can be accomplished as, as us as leaders in security and also technology through mentorship programs. And if you get, you know, someone reaches out to you on LinkedIn, you know, form that bond with them or be a mentor to someone, get involved with those programs so you can train up the next generation, at least provide a little bit of advice. Absolutely. Um, so I, I, I always run into folks and they say, how do I get into cyber? I say, well, you just took the first step. Yeah, exactly. And, so and for those of us in leadership, when we came up, there was no straight path to cyber. We all ended up here yeah on accident, sometimes by design, but not because that's what we wanted to be in high school, right? So I think we owe it to the community, owe it to the people who helped us to pay it forward and, and to help others get in. And, and it's also, it's self-serving. It's going to fill the gap in the cyber workforce. So when somebody does reach out and I probably get three or four of these a month and I say yes to all of them because somebody did it for me and I fully intend to pay that forward. Yeah. So I couldn't agree with you more there. And, uh, and I think that awareness is the best cyber weapon. So I think we're out of time, Mark. I'm looking at the clock, time check. I think we're pretty much done. So thank you, Mark Crudgington, CISO of Wood Forest National Bank. I'm Andy Bennett, Vice President of Technology and CISO for Apollo Information Systems. Thanks for joining us. And I hope you check out Mark's book and enjoy the rest of this conference, virtual as it is. And I hope to see you all, as I know Mark does too, in a personal event down the road. Yes, definitely. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for asking me to do this. I enjoyed it.